It's Bob McCown. It's John Shen. And we are here once again. Survived another weekend. And here to um, enlighten you. <laughs> perhaps even entertain you. Well, this is what I would describe, Bob. You know, when you when you talk about a guy that can, uh, you know, has a, a slider, a curve, a fastball. This uh, to show uh, today is a changeup. That's what it is. It's a complete changeup. Well, it is for the audience. Yeah. Not for us. No, and, no, and we, anybody love who's, we love it. Yeah, anybody who's followed us knows that um, our guest today has been, um, well, he was on the, the radio slash TV program many, many times. We talked about a whole variety of issues. And uh, what's what we're going to do today, I think. Um, the longtime host of The National on CBC, he now has his own podcast and a variety of other things he may very well tell us about. Peter Mansbridge today with uh, Shannon McCowan back after these messages. Uh, it's McCowan. It's Shannon. I always have had such an easy time over the last, I don't know, 30 years introducing our, our guest. Um, <laughs> now I'm not exactly sure how to intro him. He's the former host of the evening news on uh, CBC. He no, now not the evening is... news, not the evening news, the national, the national news. Yeah. Okay. Come on. No, not the national news. The national, you got to get into the CBC word book. You know, there are oh, there's certain God. things. I used to get emails all the time how I was screwing it up and everything at the CBC. So we're three formers here. Yeah, that's right. Oh, you ain't kidding, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Peter I like being a former. I'm enjoying being a former. I've never been busier. Well, I mean, so I want to I want to go down that road. Like, I know you're doing a podcast, right? Um, I know it's I don't know if it's actually technically simulcast, but um, it is on Sirius XM. And uh, but what else are you doing? What else you got going on? Well, I give, you know, I, I do a fair number of speeches. I'm sitting on five boards. Um, I'm doing two documentaries a year for the CBC, my former full-time employer. Uh, but they're one-hour docs, and they, oh. they, they, they keep me busy. In fact, I'm leaving tomorrow uh, for my latest visit to the Arctic, where I'm going to be on board uh, the Navy's new Arctic patrol vessel going through the mm -hmm. Northwest Passage. So, it, you know, that's going to be great. You know, it, I'm doing a doc on both Arctic sovereignty and climate change, and I've, I've done quite a few of those over the years. So I'm looking forward to this latest uh, visit there. Um, I do a little teaching. I do a little this, a little that. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm keeping busy, like a, a too many hands and too many pots, as they say. But are you happy? I actually am happy. You know, as happy as one can be at, uh, at, at this age. Um, but, uh, enjoying it all and, you know, having a, having a good time golfing like crap, you know, I just wish one day I could golf like you, Bob, if I, well, you haven't that, seen I'd me play really this year. Good. Yeah. But I, I'd take a day of you not playing well any day. What, what, what the, the biggest adjustment Peter might be, you know, I mean, you were, you, you were like a regular sports person. You worked at night all the time, mm -hmm. working at night. I mean, you know, you know, not not traveling as much, even though you are traveling. But the, the the reality of, hey, people actually do things in the evenings rather than rather than watch me. Uh, I thought so they that, used to go to restaurants and movies <laughs> and theater, and then suddenly for the last two years, none of that's been happening either. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, I am getting a chance to actually watch uh, games that uh, that I didn't get a chance to before. Um, mm. but, uh, but it's all good. What time did you used to have dinner when you did the, uh, the late show? I what, had, what dinner was dinner time for you? Six thirty at night. And it was some, you know, crap that we found in the, one of the yeah. cafeterias downstairs. An old, and now an old friend of John's Freddie Parker and I had dinner together oh. every night. He was the director of the national and we had dinner every night for like 30 years. Um, uh, now it's, uh, well, I don't know, anywhere between, uh, 5.30 and 7.30, depending on what sh uh, which sure. show we're watching off which streaming service. Yeah, but that doesn't stop you from texting Parker and saying, are you watching this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I went through the same thing. I mean, I never had dinner before 7.30. You know, I worked till 7 and, and didn't have dinner till 7.30. And the other night, I, I went to a friend's place for dinner. And I said, what time's dinner? He said, 5.30. <laughs> and I thought, well, are you out of your mind? That's like, that's like late lunch. 
that's that's the senior serving time. That's the best <laughs> well, <deal>. well, <laughs> well, that may tell. Janet's I hadn't thought of that. Up. But well, thank you for Janet's reminding. Me. Waiting outside. So, well, uh, I got a bunch of things I want to okay, talk go, about. Go, you, you go, go. All right. no, go, go. Well, let's start with uh, the most recent news, I suppose, um, uh, the election announcement, mm-hmm. which is of no surprise, really. But how do you feel about calling an election while we're still where we are in, in, um, in life and in society with COVID is still a, a, a around us. Um, it is gaining momentum once again. Is there something, well, do you think the public will react negatively to this? You know, that's, it's a really good question. And I know it's one that uh, the liberal strategists have been worried about for the last week or trying to make a determination on. There are two camps. One that uh, this is not good. Why are we doing this in the middle of what appears to be a you know new wave of the of the pandemic? And the other camp is, listen, we don't wish anybody harm, but this does highlight the situation and whether or not we're the right people to be handling it and what the other parties are offering to handle the pandemic themselves. And who would the public be more comfortable with at this time if we're still in the soup? And which clearly we are. Um, so I, I, that's the way it's been back and forth. Listen, minority governments, you know, the average length of a minority government in Canada is just under two years. So we're right. kind of at that point mm-hmm. anyway. And as much as the opposition parties are saying, hey, you know, we were letting them do what they needed to do. Yes and no. There was a lot of stuff didn't get passed, didn't get, uh, you know, through Parliament, got hung up on different times. Um, but... Listen, you know, this is the way I look at it. We spent, we're going to have a deficit of what, more than a trillion dollars, mm-hmm. or the debt is going to be more than a trillion dollars. The deficit's over like $400 million, billion for this year. Um, at a certain point, you know, the, public's, the public didn't elect this government to handle a pandemic or to spend that kind of money. The, no, we didn't know it was coming. We knew about it, right? Yeah. But now they do know about it, and it's going to have a huge impact on our lives, not just the health situation for our lives, but the fiscal situation for Canadians for years to come. And, you know, should they have a say in the, in the way things unfold from here and uh, an opportunity to pass judgment on, on the way it's been handled for the last two years? And you can make that argument, just like you can make the argument, do nothing, no election, just stay the way it is. Uh, it's a tough one to call. I I can see arguments both ways. But to to be the devil's advocate, don't we elect governments to manage crisis? Absolutely. And we elect governments to protect. Yeah. So, 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 so that, but isn't, so isn't managing the COVID situation part of their mandate? Yeah. And that's what they've allegedly been doing for the last almost two years. Hmm. And is this a point at which, you pass judgment on that. I mean, listen, we're in a fourth wave and it clearly seems to be impacting more the unvaccinated than the vaccinated. Uh, There's been a a tremendous amount of movement on vaccines. Canada leads the world in, uh, in both the vaccinated and, and the partially vaccinated, uh, which is, you know, pretty impressive for a country that doesn't even make their own vaccines. But you know, this argument to counter yours would be, well, you know, we're through the worst of it. And we're dealing with right now trying to get people who are not vaccinated, vaccinated. Mm-hmm. And clearly there's an issue there in terms of that. Some people don't want to get vaccinated ever. Others are still hesitant for various reasons. Um, but, you know, I want to believe, and I do believe, that we're through the worst of it. We'll see. Well, we'll see whether the electorate agrees that Trudeau's strategies and his more more his performance, and and whether or not they agree with the other guys' strategies. Yeah, to you to know, a great there, extent, there, there, there are issues there too. Well, you would concede, though, Pete, that that uh, Trudeau would never have called this election six months ago. Um. No, and because, he would never call this election if uh, if he'd been down in the polls. 
Well, that's the other, those are the exact two points I was going to make. Like six months ago, um, everybody was going, well, America's getting vaccinated and we, we can't, we, we don't have anything. And somehow that is the government's fault, whether it was or it wasn't. And, and, but it's going to, this is going to be the issue, is it not, in this election? And, and I don't remember an election where there's been an issue that's as clear as this, a single issue that dominates the decision making as clearly as this one will. Uh, I, I think so too. The pollsters are not saying that right now. They're saying that the pandemic is, is not the top issue, that it's second or third, and that you know, the top issue is uh, uh, you know, the country's fiscal health and uh, the uh, forecast for the economy, and then the more general health issues, and then the pandemic. But, you know, I think it'll come down to basically what John was suggesting is, uh, you know, a government's role is to, is, is to manage crises, is to keep Canadians safe. And are they, have they been keeping Canadians safe? Um, that may be the ballot question. But, hey, we're in uh, day two of a 36-day campaign. <laughs> you know, lots of things can change in the, in the next five weeks. And, you know, the past has, has proven that to us. I mean, there's another new poll out today that shows the, a 12-point gap uh, between the Liberals and the Conservatives, with the NDP, uh, you know, very close behind the Conservatives. Now, in the old days, which unfortunately the three of us remember, remember the old days. <laughs> very well. Part yeah. of the old days. In, in the old days, a 12-point gap in an election campaign, in campaigns that were longer than this one, um, you could not catch up. Exactly. You might as well, you know, sign off on your surrender speech right away. Today, it's much different. Things can change literally overnight. Uh, I think there will be a, a, a significant tightening up, as there always happens in the, uh, at the beginning of a campaign. But how tight it gets and what unknown factors, you know, Afghanistan, Haiti, from on the on the foreign side and any number of different domestic mm. issues that could pop up here. Residential the residential schools has to pop up at some point. Well, a month ago you would have said that would have been the number one issue. Yeah. But things change and that yeah. that's an indication of it, you know. Uh you know, it's a it's a, a factor for a lot of people. Um the residential schools question and and and, and I'm glad it is because there's there's nothing new in that story from 5 years ago. Right. When uh, when Murray Sinclair came down with his report, it was all in there, all of it, including money for uh, searching out uh, unmarked graves, mm -hmm. and the the suggestion that there were thousands of them. But uh, today, it's news to a lot of people, or it was a month ago, and um, and, and whether it will play in this campaign, campaign. and what. The various parties are saying about the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians is an important issue. I got a question, um, and, and you know, obviously, I respect your opinion on it. You've done um, virtually every election that I can remember, and been certainly involved in in politics. Do people in Canada vote party, leader, or issues more than anything else? Well. Uh, Things have changed. You know, when I started covering politics, it was sort of handed down from family, from generation to mm -hmm. generation. Party. Uh, the party. Yeah. Uh, now it's, I, I'd say, much more a combination of, uh, of, of the leader and, and the issues. And, you know, usually when you, at an election, it's, you're passing judgment on the government of the day. You know, you're either keeping them in or throwing them out. It's rarely about the other guy or the other woman or the other party. Um, issues, you know, as I think both of you are suggesting, the issue one would think is clear here because we've all been living with it for the last 18 months. Um, but, you know. Maybe not. But if, if the issue is what we've been living with for 18 months, what's the question? Is the question... I'm happy with the way it's been dealt with, all things considered, or I'm unhappy with the way it's been dealt with. I'm, you know, uh, it, the, the liberals seem comfortable that if the question is, are you happy, are you confident in the way it's been handled, they're, 
they're confident they can win that election. We'll see. The, the, the thing that the, the thing that uh, that I'm always wondered about, particularly with the pandemic, is is that is the the line of authority. And, you know, this is a mitigated line because how many times are we talking about what the feds tell us, or what the provinces tell us, or even what the cities tell us, or in our and our regional health programs tell us? So th- there are so many tiers that people are either trying to take credit or take blame or. I mean, where where do we where do we know? Okay, this is what the federal government does. This is what the provincial government does. And how do you manage that? You know, Pierre Trudeau used to say we're a country of shopping centers, in the sense that we're set up in such a way that every, there are all these different shopping centers, and his what he was talking about were different governments yeah. operate differently, but within the same country, and we have the same problem or same situation now. Some people call it a problem. Other people say it's the delight of of confederation, that it's the the situation we created for ourselves. We have jurisdictional governments in in the sense of the differences between the provinces and the feds and the municipals in some cases. But we've seen the clash of that in the way this has been dealt with, Mm -hmm. uh, where different provinces act differently. You've got Ayn Palliser in Manitoba out of the gate a month ago with uh, vaccine passports. Conservative government. This is the way to go. You can't get into a bomber game. You can't get into a Jets game unless you've been vaccinated and you have the passport to prove it. Fully vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Same with restaurants and movie theaters. Now, Doug Ford, Jason Kenney, they say, no, 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 we're not going that route. That's an infringement on people's rights to make determine their own situation in terms of their body and their health which I've always found a little puzzling because they're not so sure about, you know, the, the rights of women and their body. But nevertheless, that's the way it is. We've got Legault in Quebec, who's going the passport route as well. Right, right. And so you've got, you've got all these different jurisdictions within the same country. Well, well, in fact, we may end up with two passports, a federal one and a provincial one. Yeah, the federal one's more for like kind of air travel and... Right. And something, but you know who'll take the lead on this, as they always do. And this is where, you know, Bob probably has better connections than certainly the, than I do. But the the lead will be taken by by businesses. You know, what are the you know the Jets have already announced passport or no passport, they won't let anybody in. Yeah. Without double vaccinated, what are the Leafs going to do? What are the Raptors going to do? What are the Habs going to do? Um, businesses, big businesses will make decisions as, you know, the tech companies are doing and every business is is confronted with this right now. What are we going to do? How are we going to determine who comes into work, who doesn't come into work? What are we going to say to them? And how prepared are we? What are the lawyers telling us about how we can handle this story or this situation? That's going to be the kind of developing story. And I think you'll see it be a campaign issue as well. Uh, we saw a hint of it yesterday with the questioning of Aaron O'Toole, the conservative leader, about mandatory vaccines, which is, is a funny word. It sounds weird because it's not like you get strapped down and forced to have a, a vaccine. Um, but that's going to be an increasing question, and businesses will be at the forefront of determining the kind of you know society in, uh, in which we live. Well, I guess my opinion doesn't really matter here, but um, I look at, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't um, try and get everybody vaccinated. And if it, if for no other reason, I mean, let's put safety aside, which is a ridiculous thing to say, I know, but if mandating that people be vaccinated in order to conduct their lives reasonably normally, if that is necessary, then I'm for it. Um, I'm for it not to keep them away, but to make them realize that a vaccine in all likelihood is not going to hurt them and may save them. And there's my two cents for what it's worth. I want to, I want to throw it. Um, I want to talk a bit, a bit of sports with you and some other stuff, but, um, your, your podcast today is on Afghanistan and what a remarkable, 
uh, change we have seen there over the last couple of weeks with the Taliban now firmly entrenched and completely in control. Yeah. Should, did we anticipate this? Should we have anticipated this? Well, we certainly should have anticipated it. Um, first of all, my podcast today is it does do a little thing on Afghanistan, but it, it's mainly about the election. But that's not okay. here nor there. The um, here, here's my take on Afghanistan as somebody you know who obviously followed that story very closely, but also went there a couple of times in 2003 to Kabul and 2006 to um, Kandahar. Uh, the this is the writing has been on the wall and very visible for 10 years of what was happening here. You know, the uh, most of the coalition forces pulled out. We were in one of the first groups to pull out after mm -hmm. saying, you know, we'd never cut and run. Yep. We cut and run. That's exactly what we did. And we were we were out of there. Um, it was clear that from the moment the Americans started talking to the Taliban about a, some kind of a peace agreement, that this was going to happen. That once the Americans left, the Taliban would just move right in. They were already moving in even when the Americans were still there. Uh, but they've, you know, the last couple of weeks has been dramatic since the Americans, you know, pulled out and left, back, left the Bagram Air Base and left a few other places. Um, it was clear what was going to happen. So to me, the only surprise over the weekend was the fact that people were surprised at what happened. Of course they were going to move back in. And of course, the Afghan army, which all of us, including the three of us, spent in total billions of dollars, mm -hmm. a 300,000 strong army. So they had the means to defend that country, but they didn't have the will. Mm -hmm. And we knew they didn't have the will. The more you talk to different veterans, not just Canadians, but Americans was, these guys don't want to fight. They have no will to fight. Their people don't want them fighting. The people just want peace. And I remember 2006, sitting in remember mullah omar he was the former head of the taliban sure uh you know he was the pal of uh, osama bin laden the house the compound he had i was at that place and talking to the uh, another former uh taliban leader who now was working for the americans um sitting there with him on you know a rug on his front lawn and i said to him you know he was watching closely what the Canadians were doing around Kandahar, and he said, I asked him, well, how's this going to play out? And he says, too late. He said, you had three years when you came in here to turn this situation around, and you weren't able to do it. And the people are tired of the fighting and the blood and the killing, and they just want peace. And if it means they got to go back to the Taliban, then they'll go back to the Taliban. And that's what's unfolding and happening there now. And the army, the Afghan army, realize that that's why they you know, they're folded like a cheap suit but uh, peter can, can there be peace under the taliban well that's the big question first of all there's no like taliban singular right problem with dealing with the taliban are there are all kinds of factions you know they're, they're the guys who are standing in the ex-president's office i've been in that office uh yesterday and uh then there are the frontline fighters who are chopping heads raping mm -hmm. women and girls. Mm -hmm. um, some of that's going to keep happening over these next weeks and months. Um, and you'll have the frontline guy and saying, we want peace and we're going to do this, you know, hand over nicely. And then in the front lines, you're going to see something else. But, it, you know, I, I remember the first time I was in Afghanistan talking to General Rick Hillier, who was leading not only the Canadian forces, but the international forces at that point. Mm -hmm. and uh, saying to him, why do you think this can work when every other foreign army that's ever come into this country over time mm -hmm. has lost and has retreated, the tail between their legs? And he said, well, we're different. <laughs> well, they weren't. As a team. Uh, apparently not. Yeah. It was very sad to watch um, the, the pictures on television, specifically, of I mean, many things, but specifically of thousands and thousands of people at the airport looking for a way to get out what and that remind you of oh yeah and there is no way out no there are no planes there are no planes going anywhere that can get you out and um 
it it kind of it kind of puts a pin in the map of the desperation that well, these people have right now. And we've seen it before. I mean, isn't oh, sure this, we have. Isn't this Saigon in 1975? Yeah, even right to the helicopters on the right, roof. right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, it is a, a sad and overwhelming story. And look, you know, we lost a lot of people there, 158. Um, and hundreds of others are damaged for the rest of their lives. Uh, we spent gazillions of dollars. It all looks bad today, and there's a lot about it that is bad. But there was good done during those years that the Canadian troops are on the ground. You know, they rebuild infrastructure. They help mm. set up. Uh, civic governments they uh, you know they protected women and girls and built schools for them and there were some wonderful stories about all that and you wonder now you know what's happened to those women and those girls especially what's no the, kidding what's going to happen to them in the future you see you saw it already yesterday i mean there, there's always been burkas in afghanistan but it's the return of the burka mm -hmm. In a, in a much bigger scale yeah. than we've been used to in the last 20 years. Uh, Peter Mansbridge is our guest. Um, we'll address some lighter subjects. All right. Like what sports he's watching and uh, what he thinks of it. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll do that when we uh, come back after these messages. It's McCowan, it's Shannon, and Peter Mansbridge is uh, with us. Blue Jays still your favorite thing right now in the sporting world? Well, at this moment, they are. I mean, God, well, I sure. The days when you used to do your show from, remember the bar or the restaurant or whatever inside the on sight lines? Yeah, exactly. I remember yeah. coming down there to sit with you on those. I mean, I, you know, I, I've been watching the Blue Jays uh, more this year than I have since I guess it was, what, 2015? Was that an yep. incredible year? Me too. Um, and it's been they've been fun to watch and man they can they can hit they have the odd stumble certainly on the the pitching front um you wonder how far it can go and how long it can go but it's been fun to watch and uh and they've got some real characters on that team and uh and i've been enjoying that so they're you know after the uh the disaster uh, with the leafs um I've tried not to talk about <laughs> ever since that final night. Um, the Blue Jays have given us something else to think about and to watch. Would you just uh, another COVID thing? Would you go to a game? Would you have any issues about going and being one of the 15,000 at Rogers Center? Uh, I don't think I would. I, you know, six months ago, I would have said, I can't imagine it going back to a game of any kind, whether it's baseball, hockey, basketball. You know, I've got season tickets to both the Leafs and the Raptors. Um, and I'm assuming I will go this fall to a, a Leafs game, but I haven't heard. Have they, uh, they haven't said yet, right? Whether no announcement. Follow like the Jets in terms of uh, nobody unless you're double vaxxed. Um, no. it, it'll be a, an odd feeling uh to go sit in there um but i took my first plane ride a couple of uh, weeks ago and that was an odd feeling for a moment but i kind of got over it mm -hmm. and you kind of move along oh i still have it when i go to a restaurant to be very honest at least momentarily yeah i've it, been it, in a restaurant yet oh no i i lie i i was in one uh last week but it was kind of a half open restaurant like they, there was yeah you know the 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 ceiling was open <laughs> um deliberately or otherwise <laughs> deliberately so or not yes deliberately it was on purpose what was amazing to me was to watch uh, football games out of winnipeg and regina to see that many people uh but all vaxxed, of, right Bombers, uh, were in winnipeg in, Win yeah, in winnipeg in winnipeg yes in and not in regina i don't think but to see that and not very many people masked uh, that to me was was surprising but it's great it was great I, I tell you what i've enjoyed the cfl more than ever you're still a bomber season ticket holder right am i yeah no i was no? a jet season ticket holder. oh you're a jet season ticket holder okay. i was uh, not anymore i couldn't afford all these you know i'm a <laughs> pensioner for crying out loud. oh yeah oh <laughs> <laughs> uh. I'm in the middle of a move, but I have a violin here somewhere. Let me see if I can find it for you. <laughs> right. uh, 
Well, how so you got to see Saturday night hockey games, but very few, if any, midweek hockey games over the course of your career at CBC, I would think. Right. And probably similarly so with baseball. You got to watch on the weekends, but not during the week for the most part. Isn't that true? Yeah, it is true. I mean, I'll admit that I used to have a monitor in, built into the desk to watch certain sporting events, even at night. Um, but uh, for the most part, what you're saying is true. Um, <laughs> well, Shannon, almost Shannon used to hook up a monitor for me out of when I used to run hockey we, night. We used to, the, the magic of working at the CBC building is if the Jays were in any sort of run, it was really nice. You, you could actually walk across the street and watch That's three right. innings and get back. Yeah. That's how I watched the great game in, in 2015. I was over there, you know, for the with the Bautista bat flip. Yeah, I saw that, and I kept delaying and delaying departure because it was a late afternoon game, if you recall. And I I stayed there till like seven thirty. I saw the seventh inning, um, and uh, and managed to just get back in time to yeah. get organized uh, for the national that night. Yeah, and for those around the country that aren't aware, the uh, CBC building. I keep wanting to say the new CBC building, but it's not that new anymore. How old is that? <laughs> That really shows how old you are, buddy. Well, <laughs> it's 30 years old, Bob. It's 30 nobody years re- old. Nobody remembers that they used to be on Jarvis Street. Um. Oh, oh. <laughs> I do. Yeah, 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 I know, but the you're three old. of us do. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like, if I got a call today and said, can you come down to the CBC building, I probably would start heading towards Jarvis and go, oh, oh, they probably they probably mean the Front Street one. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the last show I did in the old Jarvis Street Studios, Studio 2. Um, this would be somewhere in the early nineties. So it was Pam Wallen and I, we were in there one night and everybody was getting ready to move to the new building and, um, they dragged a lot of stuff out and we were doing the show and a raccoon walked right across the <laughs> studio floor in front of us. <laughs> Tells you everything you need to know, huh? Exactly. Oh yeah. yeah. Not a moment too soon. <laughs> How are things, how are things in lovely Stratford? Stratford's great. You know, still happy there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I bounce back and forth between Stratford. I know you do Toronto and uh, we got a little cabin up in the Gatineau Hills outside of Ottawa, but Stratford, I mean, it's been a tough year and a half because you know, Stratford, you know, so goes the festival. So goes Stratford in many ways because it's has so many supporting industries with the, uh, you know, the various uh, bed and breakfasts and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, without any theater last year, hurt big time. This year they're doing theater, for the most part, in tents outside uh, to keep people happy. But it's a struggle. And it's been a struggle for, for everybody. But it's still a beautiful city, and mm. uh, uh, we uh, we enjoy living there. One final question for me. I, I couldn't help, uh, in the previous segment, you talked about... Uh, election being called and 36 days later we're going to have one and then we have a few american listeners <laughs> right to, the, to this program and they're saying hold on you're going to call an election and have it done in 36 days <laughs> compared i mean it's 36 months almost to the next election and there's campaigning already starting and the midterm election stuff i mean it's become an industry in the united states compared to what we do it is, and uh, and it has been, and it, you know, it used to be, uh, it used to be long. It used to be eight weeks. Um, uh, the campaign length in Canada was determined by the train schedules in the right. early days, yeah. uh, because you know, if the, the the various leaders wanted to try and cross the country, they they had to go by rail. Uh, they finally speeded things up. Uh, I don't know, twenty years ago, and, and reduced it to a five week campaign which seems awfully long to some people, but <laughs> not to our American friends uh, who have to live with a constant campaign. I mean, they're already, I mean, the guy's only been in office for six months and they're already talking about next year's midterm elections. Yeah. So like, you know, it, it never ends there. The cycle just keeps on going. Uh, before we let you go. So you mentioned, well, we know Stratford, we know Toronto, you got the place in Gatineau. You still got your place down in Florida too? No. No, did no, you get rid I, of that? Actually, I got rid of that just before um, COVID hit, and uh, the prices in that particular area have uh, have, uh, have plummeted uh, as a result of COVID. They'll bounce back when the, you know the, 
all this ends, and it will end, mm. you know. I mean, it, it, it's taking longer than we thought it was going to do, but it, it, it will end. You know, there, there, there is an end date to this thing. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people have suffered, uh, you know, some with the ultimate uh, point of suffering, but, uh, but many people on many other levels, and uh, we'll all be glad when it's over. I thought it'd be over by now. Um, and I was wrong. I mean, the, the, you know, the awful flu of 1918, 1920 uh, kind of ran its course by, by 1920. And think of it then. They didn't have anything like we have now in terms of the vaccines we have. Right. They were, their primary source of defense was exactly the same then as it is today. Mask. Mask. That's it. Um, but with all the technology advancements of today we're looking here a hundred years later at something that's going to last at least as long maybe a little longer now there's a much bigger population and there's a worldwide influence that didn't sure. exist then um uh, of the movement of the virus but uh, nevertheless it's interesting to look back at history and see these these things take a while well when we first started chatting uh, mansbridge was bemoaning uh, the status of his golf game <laughs> and now that he's sold his place at, uh, you were at Innisbrook, right? I was at Innisbrook. I'm still working with Innisbrook. I still have uh, some kind of complimentary um, membership there. So I still get to play. And I was last down just uh, just before the COVID struck. Well, I'm looking at getting a place there. And I thought, well, it'll be great because Mansbridge and I will be able to play golf now and then. And Cooper and whoever else is uh, down there. Right. But um, we can So now I'll have to invite you down as a guest. No, no, no. I, I, I have, I have full membership rights, so we can. Uh, we well, can you need stay. a place to stay. Well, that that you probably don't that. even need that. No, I'm, I'm okay on that. <laughs> 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 well, and they've done a fantastic job with the course, as you know. I mean, the oh, it's beautiful. Is, but Copperhead, the, the main course, the PGA course, is a, is a terrific course, and the, the place is extremely well run. And you can probably get a really good deal right now. I'm calling so, as soon as we finish. Yes. <laughs> or there's four four real estate guys calling you right now. Just mention my name when you do that. That you're they'll charge and they'll, char they'll oh, charge. They'll charge you kick, double. My little kickback, huh? Check will come back. <laughs> little kickback. All right. I'm a struggling pensioner. I need. Oh. <laughs> Happy to help you out, Mansbridge. You know that. Um, listen, it's great to see you, and uh, I know, as you said, uh, you're uh, busier than a one arm paper hanger here, and so uh, we thank you for taking a few minutes for us. We're always appreciative. And um, we'll look forward to seeing you somewhere down the road. Thanks, pal. Hey, Bob, John, great to talk to you always. The legendary Peter Mansbridge, back after these messages. Well, Shannon, rarely does Mansbridge, no, never has Mansbridge come on, with me at least, and I didn't learn something. Um, and I'm, mm. I'm, he's, um, he, He's the guy when, you know, when you, when you want to talk about world events of any kind, um, you go to Pete. Yeah. And, and with the, with the election call yesterday, it, it, to me, it just made some sense that, uh, we get somebody who can, um, uh, serve up something a little different in the, uh, in the dog days of summer. Uh, the, the, the fascination for me is in, in just sitting back and listening to Pete is, uh, I must admit as a guy who was a regular viewer of the national, I missed the voice. I, I miss seeing him, his cadence, his, uh, you know, the, uh, his soothing nature to me, you know, he, he, when, when you think of all the great broadcasters that have done national news in both Canada and the United States and Peter turned down chances to go to the United States. Yep. Um, it was really, it's really nice to have him around to, to talk about these kind of things. Well, I, I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, to the point where I can't even imagine at this point who the second choice would be. Who would it be for you? Like, if Pete couldn't come on with us and we wanted to talk about these subjects. I mean, we talk about this mm. because we have Pete, not because we necessarily want to inject ourselves into the, you know, the generic world. It's not what we're known for. But, like, who's your second choice? Yeah. I don't know. Everybody else is tied for second. And we don't, we only like going for number one. Well, at the beginning of Pete's career, Lloyd Robertson was over at C uh, CTV and, and Lloyd came on the program on numerous occasions. And I, you know, always respected and enjoyed him. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Um, Now, he was at CBC years before that. But, you know, maybe in that scenario, there's the other guy you could lean on. Not necessarily second choice, but another guy you could lean on. I'm lucky enough to work with both of them. So they're good people. And And you know what? Both huge sports fans. Uh, both Lloyd and Peter, huge, huge sports fans. And that's, I think that's kind of what endears them to us and vice versa. Well, I must say I was both shocked and um, it was complimentary when I found out that both of them did listen to our mis- miserable little radio show. Yours, yours, not yours. Well, years ago. And, and that kind of opened the door to have a conversation with them. And, and they were both very generous with their time, especially Pete. Mm-hmm. So our thanks to Peter Mansbridge for being Well, he's now that he's a pensioner, you know, he needs something to do. Yeah, bite me. Pensioner. <laughs> Better not be getting a pension. Oh, of course he's, uh, he's, he's over 65. Come on. I'm not getting a pension. Well, you're if you're still working, pension. you're not getting a pension. Sure you do, Bob. You can get a pension. Well, somebody write me that check if they got any money left in Ottawa. <laughs> I got to go. My phone's ringing. Bye. See you tomorrow. Goodbye, everybody.